Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight, and welcome to our third annual Patient Healthcare Forum. It's a privilege to have you all here. Uh, my name is Dr. Sharadindu Rai. I'm a family physician, and I'm the president of the London and District Academy of Medicine, which is a branch society of the Ontario Medical Association. The London and District Academy of Medicine has been around since 1919, and its function is to promote professional and social harmony, to advance knowledge in medicine, to promote health care in the community, and to assume the duties of a branch society of the Ontario Medical Association for the City of London and the County of Middlesex. On behalf of the executive of the London and District Academy of Medicine, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight to hear our patient stories. The healthcare, the healthcare system has been a prominent topic in the news in recent weeks. At the start of April, Londoners witnessed a surge in deaths from opioid overdoses. A week ago, many Londoners were introduced to new terminology, code zero and fit to sit. For the benefit of the un uninitiated, code zero means that no ambulances are available to respond to an emergency call. And Fit to Sit is a program that allows low acuity patients in ambulances to wait in the ER in order to free ambulance service for other patients. Clearly, our healthcare system is under strain, but it is also undergoing major changes. Given the prevailing theme in Ontario is improving healthcare and ending hallway medicine, we thought that it's appropriate and timely to have our patients provide direct feedback to Ontario's healthcare reform panel on how to make those changes. In each year that we've held this event, we've tried to bring broader attention to the everyday struggles that Ontarians are experiencing in our healthcare system. Tonight's focus is improving healthcare and ending hallway medicine. This year, our patients are going to present their solutions along with the struggles they've experienced in our healthcare system. We're going to reiterate a point that we've repeatedly made in previous years. These experiences are unquestionably a consequence of chronic underfunding of the healthcare system. We need our elected officials to hear these stories and address healthcare issues that cross political lines. I'd like to expend a special thanks to uh, MPP Peggy Sattler, MPP for London West, um, and Minister Yurick will be joining us shortly, so I will figure out how to work him into tonight's schedule. He's um, extended regrets that he's running behind schedule, uh, coming in from Toronto. Um, but a special thanks to uh, Minister Yurick for making that special trip out from Toronto tonight. Um, I'm also aware that Ms. Sattler had to make special accommodations uh, in order to be able to te attend tonight's uh, forum. Uh, and I sincerely appreciate the effort that you've made. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, MPPs uh, Teresa Armstrong and Terence Kernahan uh, expressed a strong interest in attending tonight, uh, but unfortunately were not able to attend due to the introduction of private members' bills at Queen's Park. So tonight's forum is taking a slightly different format from previous years. We're fortunate to have uh, Mr. Peter Rosluck. Peter, where about are you? There you are, just wave to the audience. Um, Executive Director of Mission Services of London, presenting on the challenges faced uh, by his agency. Many of you uh, are already aware that uh, we had crash bed closures at Mission Services earlier this year, as well as the funding challenges facing some of its programs, such as Quinton Warner House. Given, th given that this year, we're exploring solutions to our healthcare problems. It seemed appropriate to explore the challenges faced by some of the agencies that provide alternatives to hallway medicine. So thank you as well to Mr. Rosaluk uh, for taking the time to come out tonight and speaking about some of the challenges faced by Mission Services. Uh, we also have the privilege of hearing from Ms. Betty Joe Drent. Betty, can you wave your hand? There you are. <laughs> 
uh, the PSW coordinator uh, for the West Algon Community Health Center this evening. Ms. Drent will share with us her insights on how lack of access to home care and uh, the lack of transportation for clients is contributing to the hallway medicine crisis uh, in our ER. So thank you to Ms. Drent as well. Nonetheless, tonight is about putting patients first and giving our patients an opportunity to share their stories of the difficulties that they've experienced navigating the healthcare system, adverse consequences as a result of a lack of timely access to healthcare, as well as exploring some of their solutions to our healthcare woes. It takes a lot, I'm sure you can appreciate, to discuss these issues in an open forum. And I'm very grateful to all of our patient panelists for sharing their stories today. So thank you to all of you. I'd also like to uh, thank our executive assistant, uh, Ms. Michelle Mazenville, uh, for her invaluable uh, assistance in putting this event together. Thank you to Mr. Frank Rubini from the Ontario Medical Association for helping uh, usher patients into the room and uh, his uh, assistance uh, with the event. And also thank you to all of our audience members uh, for being a witness to those stories. It means a lot to us. Now, a bit about the format for tonight's event. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the event as well this year. Each of our MPPs has been allotted five minutes to speak, and our patient panelists, including Mr. Roslick and uh, Ms. Drent, have been provided eight minutes apiece uh, to speak. Uh, members of the audience should have received a cue card and a pen, and I personally tried to make sure everyone got one, um, when they registered at the front door. If you did not receive a cue card, please raise your hand now, and someone, either Michelle or Frank, uh, we'll come around to give you a card. Please write down any questions that you have uh, for our panelists on your cue card. The cards will be brought to me, at, and at the end of the event, we'll have a question and answer period uh, in which I pose uh, your questions uh, to our panelists on behalf of the audience. Um, one other point about the format, uh, and this is more for the benefit of our patient speakers. Um, the timer is set so that the yellow light will come on at the one minute mark. So that'll be your cue that you're starting to run out of time. And when it says red, you are plum out of time. <laughs> Just so you're aware. And I've turned the timer around for the benefit of the audience. Now, um, without further ado, I'd like to start introducing our MPPs, uh, starting with Ms. Peggy Sattler, MPP for London West. Uh, she has served as an MPP for London West since August of 2013. She has a long history of community involvement in a multitude of areas, which I cannot repeat because it will take up the rest of the evening, but that includes education, women's issues, and of course, healthcare. Recently, she voiced her concerns uh, regarding equitable access to mental health and addiction services in the city of London and the impact of crash bed closures on the hallway medicine crisis. So we appreciate her continued engagement with the Academy. And uh, without further ado, I'd like you to welcome you to come up and share a few words. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rai. I um, apologize, I have a bit of a head cold, so uh, my voice might be a little bit uh, rough. But I'm here uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Terence Kernahan, the MPP for London North Centre, and Teresa Armstrong, the MPP for London Fanshawe. Uh, Terence was actually uh, debating a motion today in, uh, in uh, the legislature for $600,000 of funding for Marymount to support families in crisis. And of course, uh, that also <laughs> contributes very much to the health and well-being of our population to ensure that, uh, that the services that Marymount provides are available to, uh, to children and families. So uh, he had a very important job to do today at Queen's Park, and Teresa Armstrong was there to support him. I uh, want to uh, thank the London and District Academy of Medicine for uh, holding these annual 
forums, uh, and uh, to Dr. Rye for his leadership in uh, pulling them together. Uh, these are very valuable opportunities for, for you as Londoners, for me as a, as a member of provincial parliament, uh, to, uh, to understand the, the human impact of, uh, of problems and challenges in our healthcare system. Uh, two years ago at the forum, we heard uh, a number of patients talk about the, the pain and the isolation that they went through as they were waiting for hip and knee replacements. Uh, last year, we heard about uh, the, the despair that, uh, that people felt as they uh, struggled with uh, mental health issues. And it's uh, not easy uh, to stand up in a room full of people and, uh, and share intimate details of your personal life. So I, I really applaud uh, those of you who are here tonight to share your stories. Um, you know, from, from the, you can go to the Ministry of Health's website and you can check uh, wait times uh, uh, data. So there, the information is there. We, uh, we can find out that 37% of London Health Sciences Centre patients who needed knee replacements uh, last year got the surgery within the target time. Uh, the average wait time was 225 days, but until we actually hear from one of those people who was waiting uh, 225 days or more uh, for their knee to be replaced, we don't really understand what that data what that data means you know what it means for the person who has to stop working because they can't they can't continue on in their job, uh, who can't uh, participate in their social activities, who become more dependent on painkillers um, to manage their pain uh, and who often become uh, depressed. Um, we, uh, we know uh, that healthcare uh, is experiencing uh, s is significant challenges in our community and across the province. Um, and there is no question uh, that we need to see improvement. We have a, a hospital system here, London Health Sciences Centre, that has been operating at more than 100% capacity for years. Uh, and this is when the, uh, the OECD the international recommended standard is 85% capacity in order to deal with flu surges and other, uh, and other peak demands. Um, London Health Sciences Centre was also one of the first hospitals, maybe the only hospital in the province, to formalize a hallway transfer protocol uh, to deal with the, da the daily reality of patients being treated in hallway uh, uh, in hospital hallways, and especially uh, patients uh, waiting for uh, for mental health uh, services, uh, we need uh, definitely need to do something. Uh, our healthcare system is hanging by a thread, uh, but I can tell you, uh, as a member of the official opposition, that we're very concerned about the direction that the new government is going in. The massive healthcare restructuring, uh, we do not believe, uh, is the solution. And we're not the only ones who are concerned about this. Almost 1,600 people wanted to tell the government what they thought about the high healthcare restructuring bill. 30 were given the opportunity, and not one of those 30 said they had been consulted in advance. 7,000 pages of written input was provided to MPPs who were re reviewing the bill, and the government allowed no time at all to review that. That data. This uh, healthcare restructuring uh, was developed behind closed doors without input. The, 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 the new uh, board and CEO of, of the, this new super agency held its first meeting before the bill was even debated uh, in the legislature and we're concerned that it's going to open the door to unprecedented levels of, uh, of for-profit involvement in our healthcare system. We've seen what's happened to home care. Uh, when that became privatized under the Liberals, it's one of the, the most free frequent concerns that I get in my constituency or, excuse me, my constituency office, and we do not believe that, uh, that increasing private sector involvement is the uh, answer to our healthcare system. So I'm really interested tonight to hear what uh, patients have to say, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Peggy, for those comments. Um, 
Minister uh, Yurik is also going to be joining us this evening. I will figure out how to schedule him in somehow. He's on the road frantically making it from Queen's Park. So I'll figure out how to schedule him in, but I don't want to hold up the event, obviously. So um, our next excellent patient speaker uh, is Paula Henderson. And uh, rather than take away from the pizzazz of any of our patient panelists, I'm going to let you um, speak and tell your story in your own words. So without further ado, Pan Paula, up you come. Come on. Hi, my name is Paula Henderson. I'd like to begin by thanking you for inviting me to share my patient's story. My story hopefully illustrates my lived experience of long waits for surgery, frustration with communication between hospitals and the LINs, and of course long hours waiting in the hallways of the ER. Did anyone else um, bring one of these binders with them tonight? How about to your last visit at the ER? I asked myself in 2019, how is it that even in states of extreme illness and fatigue, it is incumbent upon me as a patient to bring my own health records with me when I'm seeking treatment? How is it that a digital solution is not integrated across all health systems in Ontario? How is this system putting the needs of patients first? This binder includes all my medical records since I received an open heart surgery in 2010. I bring it with me whenever I have to visit the ER in London. I ask for copies from my family doctor from each episode of care at the hospital and then I email them to my Toronto cardiology team. This is the only way Toronto General receives any tests from me completed in London hospitals. Between 2010 and today, I have had five major surgeries, all risking my health as I am in heart failure and the anesthesia presents a high risk to my well-being. I have been in and out of the London Health Sciences emergency departments over 17 times. I have been admitted to hospital six times since 2012. I've experienced a wait of over 40 hours in the ER while they tried to find a bed to admit me. I've been transported by TVA multiple times and waited in the hall for an average of 14 hours before being assessed. The reality is my health failed due to a magnitude of system failures. I inherited a congenital heart condition from my mom and her mom, my grandma, called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Basically, my heart is too thick and it's harder to pump. In May of 2010, I was sent to UHER by my family doctor and later I was met with the unfortunate news from my cardiologist that I needed an open heart surgery to relieve the obstruction. This surgery was to be performed urgently at the Peter Monk Center at Toronto General Hospital where the type of surgery I required was performed daily. Three months later, in August of 2010, a sudden decision was made that the surgery had to be performed here in London. I couldn't wait any longer. I was discharged four days after an open heart surgery. No home care was arranged. I was still in tremendous amount of pain and I was not ready to go home. But I did. This was the beginning of what I would learn to experience. I wasn't just a patient. But I now was an advocate for my own care. And I would begin to archive in my binder my health story over the next nine years. I had begun working in the healthcare sector after I rejoined the workforce in 1996 after the births of my children, starting at the London Middlesex Health Unit. Um, ending up at the Southwest CCAC, now the Southwest Lynn. 
At the time of my diagnosis, I had worked up my way up from working in client services to become a data analyst and join a senior team of healthcare professionals focused on improving community care for our community's most vulnerable. I made my own home care referral that night in August. Most people don't realize this can be done, but this was the area of health care I worked in. I understood the system. I understood the challenges and the barriers faced in home care and long-term care settings. And I also knew the hospital should have sent a referral to the CCAC on my behalf before I was discharged. The horror stories I heard at work with patients being discharged without a home care assessment was now my reality. I was so disheartened that the very agency I worked for missed me in the cracks. If anything I've learned working in healthcare was that communication between stakeholders and clients was of the utmost importance. Why is there still insufficient capacity of nurses and PSWs in the community to support people in their homes. The money the government announced they will be investing is below the rate of inflation. How are these monies going to be translated into more home care for people in this province? Will homemaking be brought back to help keep people safe in their home, conserve a patient's energy, and keep them from declining and returning to the ERs? My binder was becoming heavier. My health was declining. I wasn't able to return to work. I had to sell my house and move to a one-floor apartment. In April 2012, a year and a half later, I had a cardiac MRI conducted, and it revealed that my surgery in 2010 had not been performed properly. So all the hours wasted in the ERs only told be told to go home and exercise wasn't all in my head. On August 3rd, 2012, at the Toronto General Hospital, the place where I should have had my surgery in 210, I had a revision of my original surgery, and then I sustained a cardiac arrest. I was sent to rehab in Toronto for three weeks. My family doctor and cardiologist in Toronto have been instrumental in my care. If I didn't have my family doctor, uh, Dr. Bayana, advocate for me these years, I don't know where I'd be. My home care nurse has changed six times. I've had five care coordinators from the Southwest Land. So again, my binder is getting heavier and worn, and I'm tired of repeating my story. I cannot overstate how frustrating it is not to have the cooperation between the Lynns in our province. I was told once here at the London Hospital, we don't need Toronto's permission to treat you. And I said, no, no, you don't. I'm asking for collaboration. I'm asking for cooperation. I'm asking for transparency of my medical records. So I'm resigned to carrying around this binder. I'd like to move on to remind you to ask the right questions to get the right answers. We as patients must speak up to our family doctors, to the doctors in the eMERGE, to doctors outside the LIN, to our MPPs. We must engage with doctors in a way we've never done in the past. We must ask the questions that underline the challenges I have had to face and that patients like me face every day. How can our health care system communicate better between doctors, hospitals, and the LINs? How can we ensure patients receive home care they require, including homemaking, which helps patients stay in their homes, conserve their energy, and keep them from declining and returning to the ER? How can we better maximize St. Joe's urgent care here in London, which can relieve a demand on the ERs and free up time for the eMERGE docs to treat patients? Could nurse practitioners be better utilized in our system, in our, in our ERs? An echo done in Toronto should be a source of assessment here in London, and vice versa. Why waste healthcare dollars unnecessarily between the lens? How can we reduce the size of the bloated bureaucracy 
at so many levels within our health care to serve patients better, reinvest these monies for direct patient care. Only through collaboration, transparency, respect, and a patient's first attitude can we restore the health care system all Ontarians count upon in their time of need. My faith is strong and it's kept me afloat during the roughest days. My son Patrick is my rock. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Paula. And you are well within your time as well. Was, uh, is, is that timer working? Just, uh, I figure now is as good a time as any to do a quick technical check in between patient speakers, right? So if there's, I'll, uh, I'll let sound events sort that out. Uh, should we move on, gentlemen? Moving on? Okay. Um, thank you, Paula, uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, those are much appreciated. Um, and I had the privilege of meeting Patrick as well earlier, so that was great. Thank you. Um, our next patient speaker is uh, John Bowles. And without further ado, John. Why don't, why don't you uh, come up? Oh, can you have it? Okay. Uh, just bear in mind, and this is for the benefit of everyone, um, if you don't speak directly into the mic, uh, we're not going to get the footage of you. So it's, we, we want you heard for posterity. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Test one, two. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank first the London Academy of Medicine and Dr. Rye for uh, the opportunity to speak tonight. I would love to be speaking from the podium, but I'm one of those people that uh, MPP Sattler talked about. Uh, it's painful for me to stand in one place for longer than a few minutes because I'm one of the thousands of people who are on the waiting list for hip and knee replacements, and in my uh, case, knee replacements. And <coughs> thank you, uh, MPP Sattler, for not stealing all of my thunder, but uh, only a bit of it. I know that we've all seen the figures on wait times uh, that were referred to earlier. Uh, Southwestern Ontario could expect uh, to see its people waiting longer than other parts of the province. It ranks dead last in terms of hip replacements uh, within the targeted time, second to last in knee replacements for the targeted time. As the population ages, this will only become more acute, and uh, southwestern Ontario does have a larger percentage of seniors than other parts of the province. So what we have is a kind of a curious situation. We have lots of patients on waiting lists waiting to get their knees and hips replaced. We've got doctors who are available. We've got operating rooms that are available that aren't being used all the time. Problem is there's no money to fund these operations. As an example, I was talking to a doctor at Strathroy Middlesex uh, Hospital. They uh, are a small center compared to some of the places, University Hospital and some of the other centers that perform many more of these operations. Strathroy alone, if they had the funding, could perform 150 more knee and hip replacements over the course of a year, which uh, if you add up all the uh, possibilities at all of the places, all of the hospitals that do these, uh, it's quite a staggering number. So as a result, those of us who are on the waiting list wait, and uh, we wait some more. Now, we've been told a number of strategies are in place. Uh, the ministry has allocated $300,000 this year to fund some 77 hip and knee replacements across Ontario. But I think that's just, uh, you know, it's a good start, but perhaps a bit of a drop in the bucket. They're also setting up a central intake and assessment clinic this summer, so family doctors will have a more streamlined way of referring patients with hip and knee issues. Right now, it could take a considerable amount of time between the time a patient is referred by the family doctor to the time a patient sees an orthopedic surgeon and officially gets on the list. I know one person, for example, uh, had been referred in October and is still waiting for that initial appointment to even get on the list. 
My own journey began in the fall of 2016 when I saw my family doctor. Of course, you have to get x-rays before anything's done. I uh, was then referred to Strathroy Middlesex Hospital, the reason being that uh, they have a, a very accomplished uh, surgeon there, and also it appeared it would have a shorter wait time, but unfortunately, everybody and their cousin who was looking at wait times saw the same thing, and now it has the longest wait time in the province. It took some time to get an appointment, but once there, the surgeon suggested uh, physio for six months. When that didn't really accomplish much, then I was put on the waiting list was initially to have surgery this past February or March, but it was later updated to a target date of next November. <coughs> it's three years from the start to what I hope will be the finish, and my story's far from unusual. Now, I know that you're not going to die from hip and knee replacements. However, and this is a big however, your life and those of your family are profoundly affected the longer that you have to wait. I was reading a study for the website Nursing Times, it says arthritis is the leading condition that leads to hip and knee replacement. It describes it as painful and progressive. It can cause stiffness, difficulty moving, loss of muscle tone, strength and stamina. It concludes that many people also experience fatigue, poor sleep, anxiety, depression, social isolation. Some people can't work because they can't uh, move around. They see a general deterioration in the quality of their life, and yet they wait for help. Pain's a symptom that makes most people go to their doctor initially to look, uh, investigate the idea of hip and knee replacements. It was in my case. I can tell you the pain is almost always there, sometimes worse, sometimes it's not quite so bad. As the months and the years go by, it does get worse more often. Cortisone shots are available, at least for knee replacement candidates, and that does help to a certain extent and to a temporary uh, relief. But what the pain does is it interrupts sleep every night, usually several times a night. It limits and makes it difficult to do it. Many people would consider a normal part of living. For example, uh, standing and talking to your neighbors on the street for five minutes. And my neighbors are very long-winded. And uh, you just can't do that. It affects when you can drive comfortably. Sometimes it's painful to drive. It affects what household chores you can do, whether you take the dog for a walk uh, around the block. It affects where and for how long you can go shopping, where you can go on vacation, how you're going to get there, and what you're going to do when you get there. It affects. It's a constant companion disrupting every day, not just for me, but for my family, especially for my long-suffering wife, whose patience and understanding I appreciate every day, and she's sitting out there. It's usually worse with activity, but it can strike at any time. I've tried physio, I do Aquafit three times a week, as that's recommended. But those of us on the waiting list, we don't stay the same. We all experience a decline in health and the ability to do everyday things as time goes on. According to my orthopedic surgeon, the answer is simple. Simple but complicated. More dollars mean shorter wait time. Now, being as the healthcare dollars are finite, we could think of it this way. If improving people's lives isn't a strong enough argument, we could think of it as preventive medicine. That money spent now will certainly save money spent later. The people on those waiting lists are, by and large, seniors. They de are deteriorating as they wait. They're going to need more hel help from the health care system after they wait for two years, three years, or even longer. That is, unless the money can be found now to help reduce those waiting times. Once again, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, John. Um, and for the benefit of our audience, uh, delays in timely access to orthopedic surgery, particularly hip and knee surgery, have been a recurring theme over the past few uh, healthcare forums. And for uh, anyone so inclined to do so, please go to our website. Michelle will love me for this. It's ldam.ca forward slash events. That's L-D-A-M, as in Mike, dot C-A, forward slash events and you can see some of the video footage for yourself of the uh, hardship our patients have experienced uh, with regards to timely access to orthopedic surgery from previous healthcare forums. So thank you John for uh, sharing, I really appreciate it. Patty, I did have you up uh, previously f to speak. Um, I'll just extend it, you don't wish to speak tonight, okay. I can give you eight minutes, and I'm sure you'll do a lovely job. 
Do you want to come out? All right, we'll, get, we'll give you a few minutes. Patty had some interesting insights as well, and since I wasn't expecting her to be here, and I just noticed Minister Yurik wa- walk into the room, so why don't you come up? <laughs> and uh, I'll introduce you properly shor- shortly, Minister. Thanks for coming out. I know you had a long trip tonight. Um, so, why don't, Patty, why don't we give you a chance? Uh, we'll give you a few minutes to speak and uh, share your insights, and then I will introduce Minister Yurik, and then we'll return to our patient panelists. Sound good? Come on up. Hello, everybody. Um, I was prepared, and then a family emergency occurred. My notes are now at home, so I am really winging it. I also suffer from white coat syndrome, so you'll have to bear with me if you start to see some palpitations. Um, When Paula was speaking, uh, uh, there were so many notes of familiarity, some of them uh, reflecting the cross communications that we sometimes have in our healthcare system, especially between Lynn's. Um, My experience was somewhat different from Paula's. My mother at the age of 87 was diagnosed with lymphoma and so began a journey of chemos and radiations and very successful treatments and wonderful nursing and doctors. You know, cannot help but sing the praises of the people that intervened on our behalf. However, when it came to support from our Lynn CCAC, things were sadly lacking and sometimes they go from, from bad to worse Um, My mother had a subsequent hospitalization during which, when we were in emergency, we were approached by a representative of CCAC at that time, uh, who was, her role was, of course, to introduce us to the system and let us know what options would be available to us for home care and for support following discharge. I, I informed her promptly that we had a community care worker Um, that we were in the system and that we had every intention of contacting that individual upon discharge. That's fine. Next day we're admitted. We have another CCAC person come to us on the floor. Wanted to introduce herself, let us know what services were available to us upon discharge. I promptly informed her that, you know, thank you very much, but we do have a community care worker who we will be talking with. Okay, day three. Another CCAC person comes to introduce herself to us to tell us what sources, resources are available to us. And our, our other one had taken a few days off, so she wanted to make sure we were well versed. I then again explained to her our situation, and what came to me is how many people are sitting in beds like Paula was, whether our redundancy was taking away from her ability to get the help that she needed. It seems to me that there should be a very simple way that when we were first admitted through eMERGE, that it would be noted on the computer system that we were already clients in the system and that our community care worker should have been contacting us on discharge to see if our help was adequate. The other thing I wanted to address briefly was the lack of consistency in caregivers and the number of assessments that my mother and my stepfather, who is a 93-year-old blind veteran with AFib, my mother, as a consequence of her chemo, suffered from dementia, we were assessed at least 16 times over a period of eight years by eight different care coordinators. Okay. These are stressful, stressful events for my parents. And I have to say, in reality, we're not on an upward trajectory. What do they possibly think is going to improve? And I I keep thinking again, could not just a simple phone call. Check in with your clients. Make sure they're getting the care they need. Then, you know, use your other coordinators to take care of the other people in in the system. Don't waste money with visits, 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 travel time everything. I just feel that, that, you know, with the technology available to us, there is money in the system. It's maybe not enough and certainly won't be enough in the future, but it is enough 
that right now, with proper technology, we could use our money more wisely and more compassionately. And I think that's uh, you know, really what I wanted to address this evening. And uh, I'm, thank you for bearing with me without my notes. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, Patty. And for the record, I knew you would do just fine without your notes, and that's why I called you out. So thank you for those uh, remarks. Now, um, Minister York has been a victim of Toronto traffic, unfortunately, pulling into the forum tonight. And I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce him and thank him for making that extra special effort to come out from Queen's Park uh, and say uh, a few words at our forum. I know it means a lot. Uh, to our executive, it means a lot to me, so thanks for doing that. Um, hopefully, he doesn't need any introduction, but I will, uh, healthcare obviously is at the heart uh, of uh, his life from his father's business to his own career as a pharmacist, um, his role as a former PC health critic, uh, and his involvement uh, in the creation of uh, legislation that ensured uh, asthma friendly schools. So the Honorable Jeff Urick, though now Minister of Transportation, uh, continues to advocate for the patients and healthcare providers in his riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London. Uh, we're grateful, uh, our executive is very grateful for our productive working relationship that we have with him. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome him to this evening's forum. Now, because you're late, I'm just gonna, I'll uh, fill you in on, uh, better the protocol so we've given all the MPPs five minutes yellow light on this means you've got a minute left and the red light means um, you got to stop <laughs> although I don't have I don't I didn't have the heart to cut any I don't have the heart to cut anyone off and we have it in previous forums so that <laughs> so without further ado uh, Minister York thank you <laughs> Thanks very much, and thanks for organizing another health forum. It's, uh, it's great to be part of this. And it's nice to be out and be able to talk health care. I usually am talking about transportation everywhere I go. Uh, I think it's uh, very important that uh, we're hearing uh, what's going on in our local community. You know, we've, we've been government nine months, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work, and you hear the stories tonight. Uh, it's, it's not new problems. It's problems that are continually occurring, and I, I believe we're we're making progress to try to fix the system. It won't be a fix overnight. I think uh, the best thing that uh, we have done as a government in healthcare over the last nine months was ensure that uh, we followed through with the arbitration with the OMA and, and made peace with the doctors again that has been lacking from a provincial government for four or five years. So I think that's the first step in, in, in making a fix into uh, uh, the healthcare system. Uh, this past budget, we announced the health care budget is increasing. We're putting uh, more money into mental health uh, and addictions, new money, increased funding into the community uh, home care sector and increased funding into our hospital system at the same time while we're transforming uh, how community care is going to be delivered. A big announcement about uh, 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 removing the LINs into a super agency and having uh, community health teams created. The first will be up and running this year, and that should help coordinate the care, um, as was mentioned earlier, of all the uh, uh, the lack of communication involved. That this should hopefully start the communication process where your family doctor is actually integrated into the healthcare team, uh, as is the uh, case coordinator from what would be the LIN uh, now into the community would be uh, coordinating the care through the hospital. It'd be more of an integrated care. So. Uh, we will be transforming that over the next uh, three years as we get fully up and running, but the first healthcare teams will be, will be uh, starting. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough I get to sit beside the health minister, uh, Christine Elliott, in question period, so I'm usually uh, talking to her about healthcare uh, and the issues that are ongoing. Uh, she's uh, dedicated to and continuing to uh, invest in long-term care, build those beds, uh, but to deal with the uh, the 4,000 patients that are, are ALC patients, they call them those that are stuck in the hospital bed with nowhere to go. So I think by moving to improve community care, uh, working on long-term care beds, we can move those folks out of the hospital to free up money for people that need to be in a hospital bed. So 
Um, work is ongoing, and my office mm -hmm. is always open for uh, if you want to have a discussion. Delaney's been here taking notes for me from my office anyway, so I'll catch up on what I missed, and I look forward to hearing everything you have to say tonight. Thank you. So thank you, Minister York, for those comments. Uh, much appreciated, and thanks again for making that extra effort to come out tonight. Um, we are live tweeting tonight's event, folks. So uh, I apologize to the folks on Twitter as we because our next uh, speaker was actually profiled on CBC News. Uh, Larry Dan experienced a delay um, returning from Florida to Ontario. Um, I'm going to let Larry obviously give him a chance to tell the story in his own words. Um, I'm apologizing to Twitter <laughs> because I have to fiddle with my technology for a minute and bring up the CBC story because I did not want to violate copyright. So give me a second to bring up that story, please, and thanks. Michelle, is this up? Just give me a, is this story up? Okay. Frank, can you maybe take over Periscope, just holding that for a minute while Michelle figures out the technology? I really appreciate it. Thank you. Please excuse us, folks. We have, we have our... It's our third forum, but this is the first time we've ever live tweeted on Twitter. We're very excited. Hello, Twitter. All right, well, we can't seem to bring it up on the screen, but trust me, folks, he was featured in the news. <laughs> All right, so Larry, I think Michelle's going to try to figure out a way to get that up for you in the background, just for the audience's interest. But without further ado, let's get you up here and tell your story. Thanks. Round of applause for Larry. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Rye for inviting me to the forum today. I really didn't know that uh, something like this existed, and uh, I just want to say thanks. Um, I first want to uh, talk about my hip surgery after... I wasn't going to talk about that. I was going to explain my time in Florida, but I just want to touch quickly on wait times for hip surgery. And, 2015, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, needing hip replacement. Uh, it took me, well, the required days were supposed to be 272, I believe, at the time. It took me two and a half years from the time I was uh, noticed that I had the bad hip and x-ray showed I need replacement to when it was replaced. Uh, the wait time was ridiculous. I was uh, in massive pain. I had bone on bone. Uh, my hip was what they call sharding, where there were shards. And the answer to that was opiates. The first, uh, first time I was uh, prescribed opiates is when they noticed that I had a bad hip. Uh, a year later, when I wanted to uh, get my hip replaced and still wasn't getting any date for it, I went to the doctors again. The answer was more opiates. Finally, two and a half years later, I got my hip replaced. Now, me and my wife were on a trip to Florida. We had a uh, two-week cruise. We were coming back on the very last day after 14 days, and I got extremely sick on the, fri on the Saturday. Sunday, we were to dock in Miami. I stayed in the ship's hospital hold till... An ambulance picked me up on Saturday morning once we docked. I was taken to Miami University Hospital where there was no hallway I was sitting in. There was no hallway medicine that we talk about here. 
I was out of the ambulance and I was taken straight to a bed. Now this bed was just a bed and there was probably 20 of them in a row. But there was people everywhere from the lady beside me was pregnant and was having some issues with bleeding. She didn't have a wait time to get in there. I saw a doctor, and it was, or a nurse, I'm sorry, and it was assessed right away. Asked me about my pain level, I said it was about 11. <laughs> I hadn't had any pain medication since before the ship docked. And right away they got, I believe it was uh, Dilaudid or something they gave me, and it really helped. I was issued a room the same day. I had a CAT scan within two hours of being admitted. Uh, during the five, or sorry, 11 days I was there, um, seven of them were spent in ICU. Now, once I got out of ICU, I wanted to come home. I'm in Florida. I haven't been home for now almost three weeks. I just want to go home. So they have a coordinator that can coordinate you being sent home, whether you're in Canada or any other country. Now, she set up about to do that for me, and they were going to have an... Uh, a jet with a doctor and a nurse to take me back to London, and they were going to meet me in London. All that was arranged. The only thing that stopped it, apparently, there's no beds. So on the seventh day, it turned into the eighth. My wife was with me. She was extremely upset. We have kids at home. We couldn't leave. Again, we asked what was the problem. They said lack of beds. I said, Okay, I will take a hospital bed in St. Thomas, Tilsonburg, Woodstock, anywhere, but I need to get home. She agreed and went and checked all these hospitals. Again, no beds. Day nine, I'm getting better and I want to go home. They will not let me leave unless I can get into a hospital bed in London. They check again, no beds. Day 10, I want to go home. My wife's extremely upset, so again, they tell me no beds. Luckily, I met a doctor that was in there, and we talked, and he arranged that I could go home because I had spent now 11 days and was well enough to travel, and I didn't necessarily have to have a hospital bed in London when I got back. So when I did get back, I went home, and the next day, I seen my doctor, and was admitted to the hospital. When I was admitted to the hospital, I waited in the hallway, again, for four hours before I was seen. When I was seen, they never did much, gave me more opiates, and sent me home. A month later, I had another attack. By the way, I was diagnosed with pancreatitis when I was in Miami. I had another attack a month after getting back. An ambulance was called, I was sent to an emergency. Two paramedics came into the hospital with me, and I was laying on a gurney for three hours while the attendants played hopscotch with a couple of the nurses. They couldn't leave, and I imagine there was more patients out there or people that needed them, but they had to stay because of rules till I was seen. Again, the same thing happened. I was seen. Uh, no x-rays, no CAT scans, no nothing, more opiates, and sent home. A month and a half later, I had another attack, a severe attack. I, was, I called an ambulance and again was taken to emergency. Again, a six-hour wait in emergency. This time I was extremely sick. I was vomiting from the time I got into the ambulance to when I was laying on the gurney in the hallway. I'm a very loud person when I vomit. <laughs> you can be here. I imagine half the hospital hear me. But for six hours, I laid on that bed with a bucket in my hand and vomiting loudly and nobody would come to me. I asked, and my wife asked, and they said that nobody was available. Finally, after I believe it was six and a half hours, I was seen, and this time they sent me for a CAT scan. Now, the CAT scan showed that I had a cyst on my pancreas, and it's called a pseudocyst. So right now, I'm in, in, the, in the midst of getting an operation later on, if I need it, to have it removed. But whether I get it done in, in London or not, I don't know. If it was up to me, I would go back to the States. I was treated like a king in Miami. Uh, I had a, a room that was one person room. They do not have any two people rooms. They do not have wards, at least in this hospital that I was at. Now, mind you, I had insurance when I traveled. If I, if I didn't have insurance, 
they would have sent me to what they call a county hospital. Luckily, I was insured. I, I counted up, I think, almost $420,000 that I, uh, the, the insurance had to, to spend to get me back home by the time they were finished. Now, I, I heard MPPs when I got back saying that the insurance companies were not doing enough to get these people back to Canada. Well, I can tell you right now that's not true. The insurances did not want to continue to pay $100,000 a day for me to stay in Miami. They were doing everything they could to get me back. There was another gentleman that was stuck in Mexico. He was 79 years old. He was, he was there the same time I was in Miami. He was there for two months before they could get him to bed. I think it was 54 days before he got back to London. And, and actually, he, they put him in a Woodstock hospital where he died. But he was stuck in Mexico for two months. What the hospitals are like in Mexico, I don't know. But I can tell you, I wouldn't want to be there. Being a 79-year-old man with extremely ill and not being able to get back to Canada is a big stress on his family, his wife. And like I said, when he got back, I think it was a, four days later, he died. All I want the MPs to do is listen to some of these stories and understand. I know that it's money, but... People pay taxes, and there's no reason why we can't get good health care here. The United States has 10 times more people than we have, almost 300 million. And I got treated fairly and extremely well when I was down there. And they have a, a great health care system. Now, they say that it's two-tier. Maybe it is. Maybe I was at the second tier when I was down there because I had insurance. But if that's what it took to get that kind of service up here, I would be down for two-tier. So whatever it takes, I think that we should really think about it and think about the people that have to suffer. Not only the people that are in the hospital, but their families. It extends to more than just the patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Larry, I think you left your cue. Can someone... All right, thank you for that, Larry. Uh, your comments are much appreciated. Um, we are going to move to Brett Batten next. Brett, yes. you're up next. Come on. My neck was getting sore looking up at everybody there, so this is a good. My mental health journey began when I was 10 years old. I was admitted to the adolescent unit at Old Children's Hospital here in London when I was 15 and 17. In my 20s, I was admitted to the eighth floor at the Old Victoria Hospital. The next leg of my journey was two years less a day in the correctional system. I was rearrested in my early 30s and spent nine months psychotic in a detention center. This included about six weeks in solitary confinement. I was found not criminally responsible on account of a mental disorder and remained in the forensic mental health system for six years. More recently, I have experienced two ambulance rides, two mental health arrests by police, two one-week stays in the London Health Sciences Center ER department, and a one-month stay on an acute unit at LHSC. At present, I am an outpatient with Parkwood Institute. The difficulties I have faced accessing mental health care are both personal and systemic. When individuals fall through the cracks, the costs are enormous. I might not look at it, but this province has invested over a million dollars in me. You might think that would be pleasing, but many days I am fragmented. It's no one's fault, but we can do better. There are a multitude of highly qualified and deeply compassionate care providers who also need something more workable. The ER at London Health Sciences is a miniaturization and mirror of the penal system. Patients don't wear orange, but we are colored by diagnosis and risk. The ER rooms are quite like solitary confinement. I hope that doesn't sound hyperbolic because they are worse. There are no windows, and when you enter the hallway, there are correctional officers monitoring prisoner patients. And if you need to use the toilet, it is a shared jail toilet. Stainless steel, no seat. To get there, you must walk the gauntlet of police officers and security staff who all look alike. This is not therapeutic, it is traumatizing and a criminalization of mental health crisis. 
the one room I was in, I urinated in the corner drain most of the time I was there. We didn't call it the ER in jail. It was called the hole or the digger. My view of LHSC is that security runs the show. Safety and security are paramount, but this makes the situation no less stigmatizing. I realize that it is cheaper to handle chaos with security rather than hire healthcare workers, but is that ethical? Is it even humane? In the 80s and 90s, we had orderlies. They interacted with and were familiar with patients. In those days, patients had many of the same symptoms and the availability of sharps was the same or worse. But today, we have paramilitary forces in hospitals. It seems as far from therapeutic as you can get. My hospitalizations in the 80s and 90s were by comparison positive experiences. To treat everyone as a risk to themselves or others is stigmatizing and redundant. The ER and acute system are not only chaotic and frightening, but once you're there, you're only honest enough to find freedom. I deal with suicidal thoughts regularly and often repeatedly. As an outpatient, my mind was made up. If I made that decision, it would be my last. There was no way I was going to be left for emergency services or the acute unit to impart what in my estimation are traumatic treatments. We need a mental health care system that is more community-based with improved coordination between agencies. My perception is that we have a funnel whereby individuals access mental health care through the ER and acute services. I'm a poor example as I have an aversion to assistance, but individuals and families would be better served in the community. We need more mobile crisis teams and teams that can deliver care in the community. Having the police involved in mental health apprehensions is inefficient, traumatizing, and stigmatizing. The police by nature are agents of control rather than agents of care. When an individual is brought to the ER by the police, healthcare workers have a perception of that individual and it can be a barrier to compassion and care. Too much funding is being used by the police in mental health interactions, and it becomes a snake swallowing its own tail as these forces call out for more funding for a job they do ineffectively. The further they progress, the more they consume. We provide piecemeal mental health training to police who are paid $70,000 per year, while there is a shortage of mental health and addiction workers who are paid $40,000 per year. Using the sunshine list to deliver patients for health care is a dim idea, and there are more humane interventions. If a perennial patient can access the system outside of emergency services, it is the best possible outcome. The individual can depend on familiarity and continuity of care. These elements are not only life-saving, but they are fiscally functional as well. It costs about $2,500 for a therapist to see a patient once a week for a year. The bill for my one month stay on the acute unit was over $7,500. The personal and familial costs are incalculable. When I consider how quickly a mental health difficulty can spiral out of control, I think family doctors should be able to make a true urgent referral. Many of these incidents are a matter of life and death. My family doctor made an urgent referral, and had I been swiftly seen, I may have been able to stabilize without calling on emergency services. It makes absolutely no sense that you can call the police and be seen right away, but to access a health care worker, you must wait. Family doctors need to be more effectively included in the circle of care. Spirituality seems like an odd antidote for hallway medicine, but distress can be intertwined with faith structures, and some of my symptoms can be overcome or integrated by utilizing a spiritual framework. Spirituality can be a basis for or linked to community, and community supports can be a preventative factor in healthcare. Stigma is isolating, and isolation can be lethal. When I see a person of any faith, I can converse with fewer words, while comfort and compassion are a gesture I do not have to see with my eyes. These individuals can dissolve portions of uncertainty and fear. In the forensic system, the interdenominational pastor was part of the team. 
To alleviate hallway medicine, I believe we need a two-pronged approach. I see two pressure points on the mental health system. One point is individuals who need to be able to access the system prior to emergency care. Patients are presenting at ER because of waiting six months. If these individuals can see someone within days, there is hope that someone could be a recreational therapist. When I see my recreational therapist, I know there is a psychiatric nurse, a psychiatrist, and team behind her. These teams can be a great resource and can be part of a system of triage where they can recognize difficulties and direct individuals to the care that best meets their needs. Hopefully this would prevent individuals from getting worse and requiring more intensive health care. Sometimes what a person needs most is simply to be seen. Mental health difficulties are usually manageable health care needs. The other pressure point is individuals who are more chronic and require longer term beds and more intensive health care. It seems counterintuitive to have a hospital bed occupied for longer, but if a longer admission prevents others in the future, the savings are real and in effect more humane. If surgeries were left half completed, we would be appalled. Long-term treatment is integral for a subset of individuals with complex mental health care needs. The individuals who we fail to fully intervene with and for may not weigh directly on the health care system, but they still require resources from other agencies. When I drive by the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center, I know that over 70% of inmates need mental health care and addiction services. This is the most expensive backwards delivery of care that anyone could imagine. If we can alleviate these two points, I believe we can make headway in ending hallway medicine and hopefully much of the funding required will be recouped by lessening the demands on emergency medicine, policing, corrections, forensics, and shelters. We have been feeding the wrong end of the elephant. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brett, for sharing your story. Um, I especially appreciated your insights and your uh, solutions. So um, let, let's hope uh, our healthcare uh, ref reform panel is listening. You had some really interesting insights there. So thank you for sharing those. Um, I promised tonight was going to be solutions focused, and uh, it made eminent sense to follow. Uh, Brett's uh, presentation with uh, some of uh, some of our community partners. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, Mr. Peter Rosluck, who is the Executive Director uh, of Mission Services. Um, I will beg your forgiveness as we struggle with our technology to bring your PowerPoint up. And thank you, Twitter, for forgiving us as we forgive us our technological trespasses. So let's figure out how to bring up Twitter. Here. Thank you so much for um, for inviting me uh, today. Uh, I'm I'm very pleased to participate, and my presentation is going to be a little bit different. Clearly, it's not from an individual perspective, but a, uh, an organizational perspective. And I guess the question is, when we're listening to all these problems, that it could seem like a, a bowl of lemons. And I guess that the solutions to hallway medicine actually have to to come from that, and and hopefully we'll have something that that's actually refreshing. Uh, just to set the background a, a little bit, I just wanted to talk a, a little bit about mission services. Um, most people know that there are five branches, um, and we do make a difference in the community. And the, I guess the one number specifically for tonight that I want to focus on is that 3,297 in the middle of the left-hand column. And those are the number of referrals that our community mental health program made to other community agencies 
uh, in that past year. So that, quite frankly, and someone's already mentioned it too, is one of the solutions in terms of getting community agencies involved. Uh, most people know about the men's mission. It is uh, an emergency shelter for men in the city. Um, conservatively speaking, more than 50%, maybe more than 60% of the men that are in the shelter probably have uh, both mental health issues and, and addiction issues as well. Um, this past year, uh, what you see on the left is the normal ebb and flow that you would see in an emergency shelter. The, the glass is sometimes half full, sometimes full. Uh, this past year on the right, it was uh, actually overflowing probably for the entire year. Uh, so that is uh, an issue that we have. Rothholm Women's and Family Shelter is the only emergency shelter for families in southwestern Ontario, covering the, 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 uh, the area from Windsor to, to Kitchener, from Lake Erie up to Tobermory. Um, what we're, uh, it is not a violence against women shelter, uh, but it is an emergency shelter. Uh, this past year, through a diversion program, we found a lot of success in, in uh, diverting people from home, diverting families from homelessness. Um, through our uh, a shelter diversion. So the capacity at Rothholm is 20 families, um, maybe 80 people. And the reason, the how we get there is really we've got 20 rooms. And so it's a, a room per family. Um, but this year, uh, you'd, you'd normally see an ebb and flow as well. Uh, but in Rothholm, it's, it's not only been overflowing, uh, it's actually we've been crushed this past year in terms of families using the emergency family shelter. A third program is Quinton Warner House. So you see a lot, of, uh, a lot of numbers there. So this is a residential addiction treatment program in the city of London. It is only one of seven addiction tre residential addiction treatment programs in the province of Ontario that have a, a, a treatment program greater than 120 days. Uh, it normally has had 14 beds, but uh, we're having to reduce that to 10. We've got aftercare support, so graduates of the program uh, can move uh, into a supportive housing for up to a year uh, in order to transition back into the community. Um, we're having to, to reduce that back to, to five. Um, for the last couple of years, 50% of the men uh, coming into the program are from outside of the city of London. So we actually, we do serve the entire province of Ontario. Um, and the reason for those cutbacks is there's the stark uh, I guess graph that that I had to show our staff when when we were laying people off and the issue has been that over the last 18 20 years uh, the Lynn and the Ministry of Health before that was providing roughly 98 percent of the funding uh, in 2018 the Lynn is providing 51 percent of the funding uh, and what has happened is the taxpayers who are also donors are supplementing uh, this so uh, an observation that that I make is that this is actually not consistent across the province of Ontario each Lynn was was sort of independent So I'm hoping that with one supra um, um, Sort of uh, directorship over over these things. We, we might be able to to um, to solve that um, And I've, I've just talked about the changes that have happened and those happened on April the 1st Community Mental Health Program is another program that we have uh, in the city, and basically there's about, um, there are four, now three distinct programs, um, and it's really looking at, um, targeted to those who are experiencing homelessness and or coping with mental health and or addictions. Uh, a, there's a similar story uh, there in terms of the funding, as again, over the 20 years, that the proportion of funding that the Lynn is providing uh, for, for our programs is, is actually decreasing. Um, and so uh, that is a problem. So our community mental health programs, we had crash beds, uh, and you've heard in the news, and Dr. Rye referred to that, uh, and we have had to close that. Uh, now, on the one hand, that could seem like uh, some lemons, but there is something I think that's good coming out of that, and we actually were uh, unwittingly a catalyst in terms of having the, the city and the community come together to try to look at other ways of, of um, helping individuals that normally would come through our, uh, the crash beds program. Uh, so there is uh, an experiment. We're, we're seeing what the community can do. But the reason, if people ask, so what was the deal with crash beds? And again, when you take a look at the funding, that was the issue, is that over time, uh, actually, it was with mission services. The donors of the community were actually supporting 60% of that program. That originally, we, we uh, actually closed the program on our 21st anniversary of actually it starting. And it started through a Ministry of Health um, uh, program uh, originally for eight beds and five months of the year. The city provided additional funding to make it 12 months. 
over time it, it, it grew to 21 beds and unfortunately now we've, um, we're looking at different ways of, of providing that, that service in the, in the city uh, with other community partners. Streetscape is one of those things. So if, if there's a little bit of um, uh, lemonade that comes out of this, Streetscape actually is a program that um, uh, assertively engages individuals in the community. But we also have uh, individuals who go out to EMDC and try to help individuals that are in EMDC transition back into the community and link them with, with community supports. Uh, this lady in the middle was supposed to be the uh, goddess of justice. There are some scales there that she's holding. Um, we also have uh, streetscape workers who attend the um, uh, tribunals, uh, the, um, the residential tenancy tribunals, in order to help people stay in uh, in their, uh, their homes and work with landlords uh, to prevent them from, from homelessness. Uh, Transitional case managers, there's another way that, again, a community service is actually trying to provide solutions. We work with Community Mental Health Association and LHSC, so we have four transitional case managers that are on site at the hospital. Uh, CMHA has eight, Addiction Services has a, has a couple as well. The whole intent is be able to have the transition from the hospital, whether it's the psychiatric ward or the emergency department, again, transitioning them out of the hospital but not into homelessness. So there's a, a, a targeted thing there. The, our, force case, our four transitional case managers actually were a result in, or were targeted for those who were homeless or at risk of homeless. But um, when the funding came out, it was one large envelope. So actually, those transitional case managers are, are really interchangeable. But that, that is a sort of a, a, a piece of that lemonade in, in, in trying to help. And then we have a resource room was really just a, a safe place for people to be during the day. Uh, what we've seen in the city is, is fewer and fewer safer places. So our fifth program for mission services is we operate a, a thrift store, uh, a shameless plug. Um, if you haven't shopped there, you need to shop at our thrift store in the corner of York and Rectory, the best thrift store prices in town. Several different programs that we have, and one uh, is the emergency voucher program. Uh, so uh, in 1718, we actually served 4,000, over 4,100 unique individuals from the City of London. It's roughly about 80 people per week. Uh, this past week, um, we actually served 66 new people that had never been to the voucher program before. Uh, it, uh, there were 10 families that included 18 adults and 37 children and nine single men and two single women. Warm Hands, Warm Hearts is a program over the, 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 um, the winter months. We provide free clothing to elementary school children in both the Thames Valley District School Board and the London Catholic Board. Um, and we can only do it through volunteers. So we're talking about um, hallway medicine. What, what does all of my discussion and, and talking about mission services has to do with that? I think we're trying to, to, to take these lemons and make them into to lemonade. The first solution really, from my perspective, is equitable funding across the province. Um, we have seen it, how it has directly affected our organization, where there, we, it does not appear that there is equitable funding across the province. I think one of the big things when we're dealing with health is really for us and, and MPPs, legislators, to, to look at the big picture. It's not just a health issue. Poverty is not, or homelessness is not just a, a homeless issue, a housing issue. It's, it's poverty, it's justice, it's education, it's health. All of these big meta issues are actually integrated. And in order to, to really deal with, with health, we have to talk about justice. We have to talk about education. Some of the, the, um, uh, the panelists and, uh, uh, have already talked about there, there is integration in the system, and we need to look at that as, as the bigger picture. Uh, mental health and addiction funding has sorely been lacking over... Um, over decades, I would suggest, in, in the province. So kudos to the, to the um, current government that has, uh, and, the, and the previous governments as well, who have, who have made mental health and addiction funding a priority. That needs to be a priority. I think the, 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 the government, when they, waste, when they suggest something, um, they're going to be held to account for that. So that's what we need is more mental health and addiction funding. Psychiatry, um, has been a con I've been with Mission Services for nine years. Uh, the lack of psychiatric care for the demographic that we serve, for those that, that are homeless or at risk of homelessness, has, has been uh, an issue uh, for the last nine years. We just cannot get psychiatric care for the, for the men that are in our addiction treatment program. 
more than 90% of the men that coming into addiction treatment program have, have mental health issues, and, and a lot of it is related to, to trauma, uh, and we need psychiatrists to, to help with the, the medication that goes along with the, with the treatment. And finally, health is involving housing stability. Um, it, it's one thing even, and this ties into to the home care, uh, it's one thing to, to have a house. We've all, some of you may have heard about housing first, and we get housing, um, but you need that stability. You, you, uh, just having a house is not enough, particularly if you've been involved with homelessness and have had uh, mental health and addiction issues. You need that stability. You need someone to, to come in on a regular basis um, as well. So those are some high-level um, sort of suggestions that, that we would have. Um, and again, I'd just like to, uh, to thank you for... fell asleep on me. All right, well, thank you, Peter, for uh, sharing those insights. Um, really important to hear those, and uh, particularly relevant in the context of the forum. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, mental health has been a prominent theme in previous uh, patient health care forums. And again, if you are interested in hearing those stories, some of them are very poignant. Um, and I encourage you all to go to the ldam.ca forward slash events website. And uh, actually, sorry, it's on the main page, ldam.ca. I saw Michelle shaking her head. No, that's right. It's on um, last year's uh, video footage is on the main page. So go to ldam.ca and you'll see uh, really poignant stories. Um, it takes a lot of courage to share that kind of story. So thank you for doing that. Um, our, our patients have shared similar stories in the past, and we need to do something about it. So thank you for taking that initiative. Uh, and thank you as well, Peter, for sharing some of your insights as to how things need to change going forward. Um, next uh, speaker, Betty Jo Drent. Where, there you are, okay. Uh, Betty Jo is a PSW coordinator with the West Elgin Community Health Center. She's been in this field for about nine years. Um, she comes with firsthand knowledge of the challenges of staffing PSWs, uh, the transportation issues faced by uh, patients living in rural areas. Um, and she's going to give us a different perspective on solving the hallway medicine crisis tonight, because most of us don't think of transportation um, when it comes to hallway medicine, but it does contribute to the backlog uh, in the emergency department. So uh, I'm gonna, now that I'm leaving you on that suspenseful note, I'm gonna get Betty, uh, Joe, a chance to speak about that. So without further ado, Betty, Joe, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, being asked to, to come and speak. Um, and there's, there are a, a couple of issues that I really wanted to talk to you about, but I wanted to actually share some solutions that we have used as well. Uh, community support services. We believe that everyone deserves the opportunity to live independently in their own home for as long as possible. Home care and community support services allows people to safely meet their unique needs, be more independent and resilient, and live the way they want to live for longer. These cost-effective services reduce the needs for more expensive hospital care, emergency room visits, or long-term care. They benefit individual clients, their caregivers, and the healthcare system as a whole. So our focus, um, is on promoting independent living through transportation, meals and wheels and, tr and nutrition, education and supports, safety and reassurance, 
health and wellness, support in the home, intensive support programs, and adult day services. And I wanted to share a story, um, a, a real life um, story, um, about a 92-year-old lady living uh, with her husband in our community in her own home. This lady had a stroke and resulted in right side weakness. She had foot drop, she walked with a walker, and she was taking care of her husband. Her husband was 96, and she was doing an awesome job taking care of um, him who was at home. He had diabetes, uh, so she was managing all of his diabetes uh, medication and how he ate. Uh, she was checking his sugars, reminding him of his pills, and, and keeping him on target. Um, then she, she had a bad year. Um, she got pneumonia, um, had a hard time bouncing back, and she was in and out of hospital for approximately six months. So for, for in the course of a year, she was in hospital, in, out, in, out, in, out, for about six months, and um, came home with um, a feeding tube, oxygen, and really not sure what to do. Um, so we we came along, our assisted living program came in. Uh, we, um, she came on our, our program actually, she was, so she was referred to, and she was referred to us and came on our program and um, immediately needed our service. Wraparound care is what we were looking at, so we had community uh, nursing come in uh, and um, address the meds in her feeding tube. She received, um, PSW staff, regularly uh, visits and unscheduled visits daily. Uh, her husband was tended to as well. Um, and we, what we did was we sat down with her and we developed a plan. She had goals and we wanted to um, coordinate those plans, those goals with her. So we developed a client directed plan, which simple goals as she wanted to be able to uh, go to church. And that was a very important goal for her, so she wanted to be able to um, walk the few steps in order to get to the elevator <laughs> to get into church. And that was a, a very big goal for her. Um, and we wanted to help her achieve that. So again, PSWs coming in to care for her, coming in and providing um, exercise programs, walking her up to coffee um, and, and doing one-on-one -on -one care with her. Um, being social with her, um, she had a lot of anxiety over her oxygen on on portable oxygen and how that would happen and and all of that. So they provided different exercises uh, for her and and uh, different techniques to uh, kind of combat the um, anxiety that she would be well that she had on a regular basis. Um, and that and she overcame that. That was something that was pretty pretty awesome. Um, so the PSW team, the, the assisted living team, also with the uh, community uh, nurses came around this family and saw what we could do to help her. Um, reassurance, checking her tubes, uh, generally allowing her to be more comfortable and being able to allow her to uh, get back to helping her husband, which she was doing quite well. She had challenges, yes. She had setbacks, yes. But I have to tell you that she stayed, so year one, she was in hospital in and out, approximately six months. Year two, 365 days of zero hospital visits. And that was really because of the care that was provided for her uh, along beside her. So we kind of wrapped around her and gave her all the needs, that, uh, all the services that she needed. She received Meals on Wheels in the home. She received transportation uh, when she needed to go, um, what, when she wanted to go visit her, her family. We, were able, we provided volunteer transportation for her. Um, friendly visiting, um, and all the caregiving that she needed. So the whole programs of community uh, support services wrapped around this lady and gave her the success that she needed. Um, so that was a, that's a great way of uh, using the dollars um, properly, I believe, to keep people in their own homes as long as possible. That's a success story.
another gentleman uh, on ODSP in the same community, and we're a rural community way out in West Lorne. I don't know if everybody knows where West Lorne is, uh, but uh, uh, way out in the rural uh, area, uh, getting into any kind of appointments, specialized appointments in London is usually about 120 kilometers uh, round trip, which means that's a lot of money on someone who is paying for transportation, who does not have a vehicle or has no access to any other transportation. Our program uh, provides volunteer transportation, uh, which um, is uh, uh, provided you know, obviously by volunteers in our community. And uh, so um, the client is able to um, receive the transportation to get to the appointments. Is it a barrier? Yes, there's a big barrier. The cost is usually a big factor. Uh, at a, usually about a round trip cost between 50 to $60. And so if someone is coming into the city um, one or two times a month, that is a huge amount out of somebody who's receiving um, Ontario disability. So that's, that's a huge cost um, that we, we need to see changed. Um, there's no other services out our way. There is actually a taxi service, and that is like triple the cost if uh, they wanted to get into the city. So what happens if they can't get in? They're not going to the appointments. They have no money to pay for the transportation. They are not going to the appointments, and then, therefore they're uh, not able to get the care that they need and oftentimes end up in ER. That's usually what happens. Uh, but this gentleman, a success in our own community. Again, uh, we are looking at wraparound care for him and uh, provided a coordinated care plan, which um, he was seeing a neurologist, a cardiologist, a mental health team, a uh, diabetes nurse, as well as the assisted living program as well uh, that uh, came around him. So this young uh, fellow um, was able to uh, have a whole team around him, uh, keep him out of the ER. Uh, he uh, suffered from mental health. He suffers from mental health and had, would often uh, be in the ER. Um, so this type of coordinated care plan wrapped around him, uh, provided the transportation that he needed. So we, we, uh, we received funding from um, um, Elgin, uh, London Elgin uh, United Way uh, with special funding for the gift a ride program, which we were able to access and uh, provide transportation for him to come into London and go to his appointments. Um, also, uh, we were able to identify some of his needs, social needs, even the need to be able to go uptown and provide, and, and to get his own groceries, um, and, to, and to have the freedom to go out and about. And so um, with the Community Services Flex Fund, we were able to access some fund, funding for him in order to, uh, to uh, get a, a tricycle for him, a trike. So he goes around town. He is able to be independent. He is succeeding. He is uh, having the health care that he needs. That's a, a really great model on how uh, community partners wrap around someone to keep them in their own home longer. And not only longer, but successful and healthy and strong. And um, so transportation in our area, yes, huge, huge issue. We have no access to uh, public transportation. And so we're totally relying on volunteers. Our volunteers are aging. Most of our volunteers are in their nine, uh, sorry, 70s and 80s. Um, and we, we desperately need something happening in the rural areas. So that is a big big uh, push for us to um, push with uh, transportation, but also pushing with the, the challenging of uh, PSW staffing, because with the PSW staffing, we want to be able to provide, um, we want to be present. It's not just assembly line, task, 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 task. We want to be present. And so when we have uh, PSWs going into a home and providing the care, and the care that is, um, whole care for a client, 
or a, a person. We want to be able to provide that, and we need the funding. We need the, the we, you know, as we know that uh, uh, we're in a PSW crisis at the moment, and we need desperately to do something about that. We're looking at um, creative ways of um, partnering with communities and um, just different ways of bringing different PSW models. So we're looking at community partnerships. We're sharing different staff models. We're um, looking at incorporating and um, adults with disabilities and uh, using the supports and using the, the folks that we have around us and really looking at partnering better because the, the system that is now it's not really working. So we have to get our thinking caps on and really think beyond what we're doing now. And that's what we're doing. We are looking at um, different models and different ways of uh, providing PSW care in our area. So we're, we're open for more ideas. We have great um, people who are wanting to talk further with us. And uh, I think I'm done. I, I think you, you can. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that, Bejo. We literally have the room for another 10 minutes, so I had to <laughs> um, I did not get any cue cards. So from at the outset, um, I explained that if uh, we have any questions, <laughs> not the anonymity I was looking for, but, <laughs> but um, OK. If there are any other, uh, OK. Um, Thanks. All right, so uh, we, I am faced with the challenging task of combing through questions uh, whom I've not had a chance to look at and figure out uh, which gets to go first. Um, And I think we have time for maybe one question, and I have to struggle to figure out who to pose it to. Um, all right, well, I'll pick this question, and I'll put it to both of our MPPs. Um, and I actually forgot who gave me this question, so it is kind of neutral, um, other than I like the question. Um, what can uh, the provincial government do to change the power structure of hospitals uh, to take power away from the board and the CEO and give doctors and nurses and staff more input? Now, I, I believe your mic uh, is, is, yeah, it's live. <laughs> well. I'm, I'm not the health minister, so I can't create policy. However, I think uh, the movement of better supports in the community uh, system, and, and speaking to uh, Paul Woods at L LHSC, he's in agreement that more uh, support and direction should be put into the community sector. If you can pull the need of making sure the hospitals are what we focus on when we get sick, if we can pull that need back into the community to have the support so the, the doctors or nurse practitioner led clinics or the expansion of the, uh, the scope of practice for many uh, healthcare professionals we're moving on or the CHCs uh, that are out there giving them more support in the community, giving them more uh, access to patients, that will pull the, the, um, the need and the reliance on our hospital system and truly only have the hospital, I guess the end goal, to only use it for really acute sicknesses or definitely the surgeries that you need to have and, and heading down that path. Um, I think uh, the good step is, as I said uh, earlier, we're, we're on the same same path forward with the OMA right now at this, this point. I think that's key into driving innovation. You're not really going to be able to change uh, anything of the health care system uh, until uh, you're actually rowing in the same direction with health care providers. So, uh, I, you know, I don't think you can change overnight. I don't think you can change in in five years, I think it's a it's a, it's a, a long-term goal is to build up the community structures, the various ones that are out there. Maybe there's new ones. Hopefully, these new healthcare teams that are being created 
um, throughout the province uh, will take a lot of that away from the hospitals because there'll be more s smaller teams focused on a certain segment of the population to make sure they're getting the home care. Lots of examples from West Elgin where you could really, really grow up, uh, grow on that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Peggy, I'll obviously give you a chance as well. Okay. I think there is a real concern, though, with these Ontario health teams that they could be dominated by the hospitals. And I think what we heard tonight is that we need investments not just in uh, doctors and nurses, but also in the child and youth workers, the mental health workers in schools. We need uh, housing support workers for people who are moving from homelessness into housing. We need PSWs uh, to provide those kinds of wraparound supports that people need to remain independent in their home. What, what this government has decided to do in terms of investing in these kinds of, of, uh, of uh, professionals, uh, they've cut funding actually from the health care budget. There was a, a slight increase in funding, but it, didn't, it, it falls below the rate of inflation, so that means it's effectively a cut. Uh, but it's also far lower uh, than the amount that the financial accountability officer, who's the independent uh, watchdog of the, of the legislature, it's far lower than the amount of funding he said would be needed to deal with population growth and population aging. So we need to ensure that there is uh, funding available uh, to provide uh, uh, the, the sort of upstream supports that are going to prevent uh, the, uh, the, the demand on the acute care system and the hospitals, which is definitely the most expensive place uh, to provide health care. So thank you uh, to both of you for, f for fielding, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, admittedly a charged question. So I appreciate your candor and uh, honesty in your remarks. So thank you to both of you. Um, respecting the fact that we have five minutes left in the room, I think I'm just going to give my closing remarks uh, at this point. Um, again, I'd like to thank, uh, to finish by thanking um, our patient panelists, uh, first and foremost, for coming out and sharing your stories. Um, some of these are really, really uh, difficult to share, and so I appreciate you making that effort to come out and, um, and your, your candor and your honesty in, in sharing what your solutions look like. It means so much coming from you, and for you to take the time and come out and do this means a lot. Um, to our, you know, our London District Academy of Medicine executive. It means a lot to our audience, and it means a lot to your community and our MPPs. So thank you for doing that. Thank you to uh, uh, Peggy Sattler and uh, Minister Yurick uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, I know it took a special effort. Uh, fighting Toronto traffic is not pleasant at the best of times, whether you have a driver or not. So I appreciate you coming out here and doing that. Um, thank you for literally uh, jigging around your entire schedule, Peggy, for, uh, and being able to come out tonight. It means a lot uh, to all of us. Um, thank you uh, to our members of the audience for coming out tonight and uh, being a witness to those stories. Um, and everyone says being a reporter is a thankless job, and I'd like to change that perception tonight. So I'd like to thank Jennifer Beeman from the London Free Press for coming out tonight and looking forward to the story and the paper over the weekend. Can't wait. No pressure, Jen. Uh, but um, thank you for coming out. And actually, a lot of the uh, stories that I referenced came from the London Free Press, which is not intended as a plug for the LFP, but it just happened to come up that she's here. So um, thank you uh, to all of you for coming out. Thank you to our... Um, handy assistance, Michelle, who no doubt her arm has gotten strained, uh, broadcasting all of this for our Twitter audience. Thanks to everyone on Twitter who's been following this live feed. Uh, and I'd encourage you again to go to ldam.ca and see these videos. Uh, they will be processed and parsed and put on that website in due course. Um, by the way, that last question, just for the record, it did not come from the Ontario Medical Association. We have a board director from the OMA here, who, and we have several members, um, elected members uh, from uh, the OMA who are here tonight, and uh, uh, I will respect their anonymity and not point them out, but um, 
thank you as well for, uh, for the folks in the, uh, from the OMA for coming out tonight and hearing those. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll close now. Um, it is just one final remark for myself. It's a real privilege for me to come out and hear these stories. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a labor of love. I wish I didn't have to do this. I honestly wish I did not have to do this. This is now the third year that we're doing this. And um, I worry. I worry a lot uh, because there aren't that many people who have the, the energy to and the time to put this together. So I'm hoping that one of these years I can stop holding this forum. But until our healthcare system woes are solved, I'm going to have to keep doing this. So thank you to all of you.